Well, thank you for being here. We'll uh, get started. I was hoping uh, everybody would show up tonight, but I know the important people have, so that's good. Because <laughs> uh, this is uh, what we want to talk about tonight. We have talked about other times. Uh, so for some of you, this will not be new, but I, I want to spend as much time discussing this as we, as we can, as we want to, as we, as we need to, uh, because this is, a, this is a pivotal idea. What you believe, your decision about this, what we're going to talk about tonight, 
will determine your entire Christianity. That's how important it is. There's a lot of things that don't matter, that, or they matter, but they aren't pivotal. They don't, uh, if, you, if, if you believe one way on this, you'll go to the left. If you believe the other way, you'll go to the right. You, you can't, this changes everything. That's how important it is. Uh, and of course, it has to do with the person of Jesus himself. So uh, this is really a, a pivotal class. Uh, and all of Christo Christology revolves around it uh, in, uh, from my perspective. And of course, I'm, uh, I'm really wanting to know what the Bible has to say about it. So we're going to be uh, looking at a variety of scriptures probably and depending on how it goes. So I want you to feel free tonight to discuss, uh, question, um, raise issues. Uh, and uh, also would say before we get started that... Um, this is not uh, a, a topic or a subject where you will master at the material and say, oh, I understand it all now. Because there's always questions. There's always, this is bigger than we are. So it's beyond, but that doesn't, because we can't understand everything doesn't mean we can't understand something. Uh, so grasping what we can grasp, understanding what we can understand becomes really important. And there is a trust element that goes on uh, in the rest of uh, the concept. So let's start with prayer. Lord, uh, again tonight we, we come just seeking you. We're not, uh, we, we haven't come to uh, uh, pound some kind of a theological uh, concept or idea. We've come simply to uh, embrace you. And we want to know who we're embracing. We want to know what you're all about. Uh, we want to know more than what we do know. So we pray that you would bring revelation. You would open up our eyes. And Lord, uh, keep me, us, but me, from uh, making things up, from uh, going, adding to, uh, keep me focused in the scriptures and what you're saying to us. So we give ourselves to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, by the way, this is the fifth class, and we may take more than uh, one class. We may take two or three classes on this idea because this is really uh, pivotal. Uh, but we've been talking about uh, the, uh, who Jesus is, and uh, of course, Matthew's whole approach is kingship, that Jesus is the king. But he's not just any old king. He's not just, he's not a king as we view him in the normal cultural setting or world, world setting. He is a servant king. So he is the king who has come to say, wow, I want to serve you. He is not a king who's come to say, oh, you're going to serve me. And the Jesus who's come has opened up his arms and said, let me enhance you. Let me serve you. This is all about how I can redeem you, how I can make you adequate and, and uh, uh, fulfill the destiny for which I have uh, selected and called you. So he is a servant king. So all the way through his book, you get this authority kingship idea, which is highlighted then in Matthew's gospel by half of the chapters are dedicated to the subject of the cross, which is really ironic when you're trying to convince a group of people that Jesus is king and that he's in charge. They've mastered him and nailed him to a cross. But as Matthew develops it, and this is so significant as you get into the passages, he just over and over again shows you how they weren't in charge of this. Jesus himself, through the Spirit of God, somehow brought this to pass. Uh, so this was his plan all along. And he is a servant king who's come to serve you. And the washing the feet, see all the stories of the Matthew just come back to this. I want to pour my life out for you. His, how he was born, the stable, the shepherd thing, which is in Luke, not Matthew, but the shepherd, uh, the, uh, the stable thing and all, all of his birth process and, and the dilemma and, and everything that's going on in, in, the, in the lifestyle of Jesus brings you back to this, this concept. And of course, we've been talking about how this was a plan. So it was an old, old thing. He's been planning on this for a long, long, long time. And so we are constantly running, in, running into this prophecy idea that he 
constantly presents that somebody 700 years before this even happened was telling about this. So God has been after this plan. Uh, so this is not recent, not a whim, not just happening. This is an old, old plan. Uh, so we've been discussing all of that. Now, a lot of this spills out of the genealogy, which comes in, uh, ge in, gen or, uh, in Matthew chapter 1. Uh, and the genealogy, which begins at verse 2 and goes down through verse 17, and verse 17 is a summary of the genealogy itself. So he begins with Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, verse 2, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Then he ends in verse 16, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, if you, had, if you were a, uh, a Jew and you were reading this, uh, which of course was written in the Greek, if you were reading this, you would come up at verse 16 and be startled. It would shock you. It doesn't shock us, but it would, it would shock you. Uh, because you would see a genealogy is to start and conclude and when you conclude you say oh I get it in other words it comes to conclusion but he brings you to the end of the, ge of the genealogy of Jesus and leaves you dangling so that you go away with questions uh, which is not Again, and we talked to you, I think, last week, we ended up last week, with that this genealogy is in reverse of all the genealogies of the Old Testament, which is a significant fact. Uh, and maybe we need to go over that again a little bit. Uh, all the genealogies in the Old Testament start with the uh, forefather, and they give his descendants... So here's the big shot and then he got this kid and that kid and that kid and that kid and here's all the descendants and this descendant down here, clear down here, says, oh, I'm important. I have significance and this was really important for the Jews. I have significance. Why? Because of my forefather. For instance, uh, Abraham. All right. Uh, I and the Jews were always pulling us on Jesus. They were always saying, well, we're children of Abraham. We have significance we matter. We're important. And then as Abraham and the 12 tribes were set up, each tribe, they could trace their genealogy back to their forefather of their tribe. And this was so important to the Jews that any Jew of Jesus' day had memorized his genealogy so he could whip it off because it gave him uh, identity. It, it told him who he was. Uh, it told him uh, where he fit into the whole scheme of God's plan. So it started with the forefather and came to the descendants. All the genealogies of the Old Testament are that way. Now when you come to this genealogy that he gives us in, Ma in Matthew chapter 1 you have no, you do not, you start this is a genealogy of Jesus and you do not have a list. Uh, uh, Jesus is not the forefather. What you have is a list of uh, ancestors. Because Jesus in the genealogy doesn't show up till down here. So it's reversed. Does this make sense to you? So it starts, these start with the forefather and give it a list of descendants. This starts with Jesus and gives a list of ancestors. So here's Abraham, for instance. He starts out in verse 2 with the Abraham thing. Uh, well, why do we talk about Abraham? Well, the reason Abraham is so important is because of this, Jesus. See, you always derived your, your, your significance from your forefather. Jesus does not derive his significance from Abraham. The reason we talk about Abraham is because of Jesus. So this whole genealogy is reversed. So all of these guys, 42 generations of them, uh, that are listed in the genealogy all have sense and meaning and are in this passage because of the person of Jesus who is their descendant. <laughs> so it's a reversal. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that your significance, your value, who you are, 
Your importance, your significance is found in not your forefathers, but it found in Jesus. And Jesus is the pivotal issue of the histories. And all the histories revolve around the person of Jesus. And of course, in a secular sense, you can prove that by the sense that our time is divided between before Christ and after Christ. See, everything builds up to him, everything spills out of him. He is the pinnacle peak of all time. So, Matthew is giving this, this genealogy, which again is reversed. And we went over that last week. Now, he comes to the climax in verse 16. Gives this 42 generations and he says, Jacob begot Joseph. So, you got Jacob, who would be the grandpa, begot this kid by the name of Joseph. And Joseph had this wife by the name of Mary. And from them came this kid by the name of Jesus. So that's what he's telling you in verse 16. Now, uh, let's read it again. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So, Jacob, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Now, here's the problem with the verse. Uh, the, the problem with the verse is in the word of whom. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom? So you got this word, of whom? And that's no problem in the Greek, but it is a problem in the English. Because of whom can be both feminine or masculine. Which means, you can say, there's, uh, this could be whom, who, uh, uh, there's uh, Sarah is, uh, is, uh, uh, how would you say it? Uh, Sarah ran down the hallway. Uh, what would be a statement? I'm sorry. Uh, Sarah, who is running down the hallway? Referring to a woman. Or you could say Sam, who ran down the hallway. So who in English language can be either one, feminine or masculine? So when you read this, Jacob begot Joseph, who was married to Mary, of whom was born. Well, is he, who is he referring to? Who does the of whom refer to? See, that's the issue in the passage. Now, in English, it could refer to Joseph, which would make sense, Jake, because this is a masculine uh, uh, genealogy anyway. So Jacob begot Joseph, of whom was born Jesus. Ah, so his dad was Joseph. Got that settled. But is he saying that? Or is he saying Jacob begot Joseph and of whom, meaning Mary, which is Jesus? Or was he referring to both of them? Well, the, the issue is settled in the Greek language because in the, uh, in the Greek language, this is feminine. The Greek word for whom is feminine, which means he just sliced Joseph clear out of the picture and refers to Mary. So what he said is, Jacob begot Joseph who was married to Mary, of whom was Jesus was born. So Joseph didn't have anything to do with it. So he comes right up to this genealogy after 42 generations of this thing and leaves you dangling. And you walk away from the genealogy saying, well, who was the dad of Jesus? If it wasn't Joseph, who on earth is it? Where are we going with this? You didn't answer my question. What's the deal here? The genealogy is all messed up. It's reversed and it doesn't answer the question. So he moves into immediately verse 18 and says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ. And I want you to see this because this is really neat, I think. So he comes to verse 18 and says, Now the birth of Jesus was like this, was as follows. Now the word birth, guess what the word birth is? Genesis. Which is the same word that in verse 1 is translated genealogy. So the book of the genealogy, which is the word Genesis, now he says in verse 18, now the genealogy of Jesus 
or the now the genesis of Jesus, now the birth of. And so in verse 18, they translated it a genesis, they translated birth. In verse 1, they translated genealogy. So if they did that in verse 1, do we not have a right to translate it genealogy in verse 18? So I suggest to you, he's making two genealogies. Here's a 42 generation genealogy. But Joseph didn't really have anything to do with it. So he moves into verse 18 and says, now let me give you the natural father genealogy. That was the adoptive father. Let me give you the natural father, uh, the real genealogy, the down to it. It won't take 42 generations. Jesus was, the birth of the genealogy of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So he was born of God. Did you understand any of that? <laughs> you got any questions about it? Okay, so what we have just walked into the middle of is called the incarnation. Which is going to be the subject for tonight and, and maybe some other, other nights as well, depending on how well we, how, how far we get. The incarnation. This is not a powder you put in your milk. This is the incarnation. Which the word incarnation means assuming flesh. So I want to write you. I want to I wanna write on the board. It'll take a little time. But I want to walk you through and write on the board a statement of the incarnation. So you can see it, so you can do whatever you want to with it and think about it. The incarnation, it is a significant, pivotal issue of all of Christianity. The incarnation. Now the incarnation says that the second member, I guess I should put, member of the Trinity. So immediately, we've walked into the subject of the Trinity the minute you come to the Incarnation, which needs to be discussed, and we will discuss it. The second member of the Trinity, so Jesus is the second member of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the second member of the Trinity, Jesus, leaped off his throne, and you don't have to use these words, you can use any words you want to, but came from his throne, leaped off his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. Talking incarnation, assuming flesh. So the second member of the Trinity leaped off his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. He didn't assume the body of man. He didn't just assume the nature of man. The body and nature of man. And in one person, person, there was the total nature of God and total nature, sorry, of man in an indissoluble In an indissoluble union. Now, I know those are a lot of words, and uh, I'm not sure I've spelled indissoluble right. It has two S's. I-S-S. -S. Who 
Okay, the second member of the Trinity, which brings us into the subject of the Trinity, leaped off his throne and assumed the body and nature of man. And in one person, there was the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. And this one person is called Jesus. Let me read it again. The second member of the Trinity leaped off his throne, who uh, obviously you assume that is, this a statement assumes we're talking God. So Jesus is God. The second member of the Trinity leaps off his throne and assumes the body and nature of man. And in one person, there was the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. Now, there are some ramifications of this that are just, whoo, overwhelming. For instance, you might say, well, what do you mean, uh, what do you mean the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union? How do you describe that? Well, probably we can't. We probably don't know the depth of that. But what that means is that there's the total nature of God and the total nature of man in one person. Which means, and it's an indissoluble union, which means you cannot dissolve it. You can't, you can't divide it. You can't, he doesn't flip in and flip out. He isn't sometimes and not other times. In other words, you can't come to Jesus and say, oh, from his waist up, he's God. From his waist down, he's man. No, he's not. It's the total nature of God and the total nature of man in an indissoluble union. Uh, you can't say that uh, when he was walking on the water, whoo, that was his God stuff took over. <laughs> his God nature took over. But, uh, oh my, when he's dying on a cross, that's his man stuff. Or when he's weeping at the grave of Lazarus, that's his man. That His manhood came. See, he flipped. You can't say that. This is the total nature of God and the total nature of man brought together in one person in an indissoluble union. And you cannot divide it. And it is so undividable. And this, this is so, so, such a key to what we've, what we've discussed all the time in Christianity. It is so un, undissolvable that you, 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 you can't locate it. You can't go to Jesus and say, oh, there's his Godhood right there. You can't go to Jesus, oh, there's his manhood. Because they are so mixed up together that you can't separate them. Which people, that's what we've been trying to explain to you guys about the merger. <clears throat> See, I, nobody's proposing that, I, that, that a human being ever becomes God. No, but can you imagine a helpless individual literally being filled with an, a, a, a man literally filled with the nature of God in a, in a mystical union where a new creature is created? Where is the manhood? Where is the God nature? Where does, where does God act? Where does man act? A guy stands up and preaches, is it God or is it man? I, I help an old lady across the street, is it God or man? See, how do you divide that? So suddenly your life becomes an expression of this union. Which is always him. No, it's always you. Well, it's us. Wow. Isn't that phenomenal? So what's going on in Jesus is the prototype for what's going to go on in you. And what he's pulling you into. Need a microphone. So I'm having a hard time. If you had. Where does the. So as this merger happens, you're you're a new creature every every step that you take with Jesus. I understand that. But when you 
me, let me speak for me. Can't speak for you. But for me, I, I still have those fleshly, you know, the, the fleshly desires are there. The fleshly thoughts are there. And I... I you think Jesus didn't have them? You got to wonder. It, well, yeah. Well, it, then if he didn't have them, that's the whole point. He, then he didn't have the total nature of man. Well, that question come up. So it, it come up with... See why this is so pivotal? Yeah. It's hard to understand. Well, it is. But what you decide about this, and I'm going to let you continue, but what you decide about this is going to determine your whole view of Christianity. And if you decide, yes, Jesus what, did have the total nature of man and does experience all the desires I have and all the flesh that I battle, and yet he was filled with the nature of God and this new creature had victory in the middle of that then that determines my whole view of what, what is expected out of my life. If you decide, nah, he wasn't. He really didn't have the whole nature of man. He had an edge on us. Then you go in another direction. I don't feel like he had an edge on us. Not, I believe that he had the total nature of man. But where I have a hard time comprehending is, is that the, the alignment... Being perfect. Does that make sense? The alignment of Christ inside of your the total total sanctification is a proper terminology in this in this, I guess you would say, because me looking at me as a saint is a I, I just my mind don't wrap around that. My mine either. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I mine either. You know, I don't, I don't know how to Maybe it's a shift in my mind. I don't. I don't. That's what I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to. I'm trying to seek how to, how to take that and fully apply that in the proper application. I guess that would be the way to say it. Okay. Let's. Let's. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this will help or not. Probably not. But let's say. Let's say you. Uh, Luther went through that. Luther. Uh, Martin Luther. He not not Martin Luther King. The old Martin Luther. He had a uh, whole list of stuff, and that he and every day he checked it off. Oop, I failed there. Oop, I failed there. Every day he failed. Couldn't keep the list. Failed every day. So one day, can you believe it? One day, he kept the entire list. And he said, "Whoa!" And then suddenly it dawned on him. I just committed the greatest of all sins, pride. <laughs> so isn't the secret of the nature of man is I'm helpless. So I never feel like, oh, I've made it. I never feel like, oh, I'm perfect. I never felt like, oh, I, I always have this helplessness feeling, which is the secret of the union, of the dependency. Because if you could arrive at a place where, hey, I've made it, I'm, I'm, I'm perfect, I got this down, I've mastered it, then you would, you, would, you would walk into the worst of all sins. So that's that, that, the, the very thing that you think is, is the defeating point may be the very victory point of your life. That you, you feel like all the time, I'm just, man, I just, I, I, I need more, I'm, I, I, I need to be better. I want to stretch more. And we understand that in the, and we talked this in the theology class, but we understand in the dynamic of this union and, 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 the, and the merger between God and man, there is a progression going on. There is a, there is a learning curve that is going to go on forever. So the secret, and I had a long uh, hour and 15 minute conversation today with a guy all over this very subject. Uh, the, the, the key to this all then is not focusing on uh, I've got this, I've got this, uh, 
I've got this difficulty, I've got this the temptation, and, and I've got to have victory over this temptation, and I focus on, oh God, give me victory over this temptation. And I'm, See, that's not the key. The key is to forget the temptation and focus on him. If you read, where is it? Uh, I think it's First Peter. He says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, we all have focused on the idea of resist the devil. We've all focused on that. But you know, when you focus on something, I'm going to, oh, here's the devil. I'm focusing on him. <laughs> He's going to get you, man. Why? You're focusing on him. And the more I focus on him, the bigger he gets. And the less victory I have. So I got to get off of the focus. See, the secret to the passage is submit yourself to God. And that will bring a resistance to the devil. So my key is in focusing on Jesus. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mike Miller asks, so the nature of man is helplessness. Could Stephen elaborate on a little more of the nature of man? Yeah, it's helplessness. It's, uh, and uh, it, again, if I cut you down the middle and go to the core of your existence, we're talking... We're not talking about your skills. We're not talking about your talent. We're not talking about your good looks. We're, we're not talking about your, your brain and, and, and how educated you are. We're not talking that because all of those are band-aids. We're talking about I slice you down the middle. I crawl down into the core of your existence. And what do I find there? Nothing. You have no resource. This thing is bigger than you are. And you have no resource to produce life. As God intended you to have. You have no resource to do that. You were m created by God to be dependent. Want to say something on this? Yeah, that may be the worrying part. But when, when I think of nature, I think of something that comes natural. Hmm. And, and embracing my helplessness does not come natural. Uh, to me, you know, lust, gluttony, things of that nature... Those come, in my mind, natural. So my first instinct is not embracing my helplessness. Okay, and in relationship to that, when we're talking here, the total nature of man, but see, we're not talking that Jesus embraced the total nature of man's lust, the total nature of man's... We're talking the nature of man... That's a parasite that's been added to the nature. And that's not the nature of man. But the nature of man is a helpless nature. And because man wouldn't, wouldn't depend, wouldn't be dependent upon God, there became a parasite that was added to this nature, which is not who man is. It's a twisted, it's a looney tune form. Yes, sir. Yeah, and just to add to that, he's known as the second Adam, right? Ah, uh, Yes born among this new kind of man. Yes. And he said, man cannot live by bread alone, by the flesh, right? But by yes. every... Word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Yeah, so he's the new nature of man. Yeah, he is the original, we're, this is the restored nature. But see, what we believe is that when you really merge with Jesus when you really give your life to Christ and he moves within your flesh and he merges with you you get that same nature you become that nature Amen. now there are things that hold on but that's the progression and, and we've discussed that so at the core of my nature I become exactly what he was but my hand doesn't know it you know you remember that all that stuff in the theology class, my hand doesn't... See, I've trained my hand all these years to grab for me, grab for me, grab for me. I don't even have to tell my hand to do it. It just grabs for me. I, it's in my thought process. Get for me, get for me. Jesus comes, transforms my nature, cleanses it, fills me with himself. Guess what? My hand still grabs for me. What? Put that. I've got to let him retrain my hand. Which doesn't mean I'm not merged. It means it hasn't reached my hand yet. And I'm in the process. So there is the process. I 
it's a hard it's a hard process though. It feels really long. Yeah. Well, you could say it's a hard process, but again, if you keep recognizing your helplessness. See, I, I'm convinced the reason it's a hard process is because we keep focusing on, oh, this is what I ought to be. Oh, I'm not that. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I'm trying. It's hard. It's, that's hard. But if you focus not on that, but you focus on him and let him do what he is, it isn't hard. <laughs> so get off of that and get on to him. Yes, sir. But the, the continual, so every night when I lay down, the conviction that comes over me is for not paying enough attention to Christ. I, every single night I say, Amen. You know, I Good. I Woo. Realize, uh, God's answering my prayers. Woo. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's pulling you to himself. Well, absolutely inside of me, I, I, I just... I want so badly to involve him in every single aspect of my life. Yes. But then Steve makes me mad, and I don't acknowledge Christ. And it's all Steve's fault. Well, <laughs> well so the simple an there's a simple answer to that. And that was uh, C.T. Studd, the missionary, uh, that had the answer to that. He said, if, and again, and you've heard me say this, if... He, uh, if the pressure, well, I won't draw it. If the pressure, uh, here's the pressure coming at you. And here's Jesus on this side. If the pressure never gets between you and him, if you are here, he is here. If the pressure never gets here, if the pressure gets here, it'll, sp it'll push you from him. See, you get distracted. But what if the pressure was always out here? The worse it got, the more it would shove you to him. Which is the secret. So bring it on, man. Bring it on. Because the worse it gets, the more temptation comes my life. The more I'm going to run to him. The more I'm going to focus on him. The more I'm going to go after Jesus. So it's a good thing. So let it work for you. Which is what Jesus did. Let's go back to this indissoluble thing. Uh, here stands a young lady. Here stands a handsome young man. They get married. Uh, and uh, they have this kid. The child is the indissoluble union. Now, she can go off. He can go off. But you can't take your half. And you can't find your half. Oh, got your eyes. Oh, got your big feet. Yeah, but... See, this indissoluble is not the kind of where Jesus was half this and half this. He was all this and all that. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier... You mentioned earlier how he was, how he wept at Lazarus, right? So we can say that God weeps. But did God weep because he became an indissoluble with man and he took on that kind of nature? Or did God always weep? We were created in his image. So there isn't really something new, but it's just a manifestation of who he always Oh, that's, that's beautiful. And you've got a dual thing. In my head, you've got a dual thing going on. Can you imagine a God who always wants to weep, who weeps over the tragedies of humanity, but can't weep because he's not flesh? Now, for the first time, God has the ability of weeping. So we were created. Could there see in the creation scene? Could this be something of the motivation? We've always said, well, God created man because he was lonely. <laughs> see, I'm not buying that. And the old idea that God wanted somebody to serve him. I'm not buying that. See, because he's the servant king. So I'm not buying that. And it certainly isn't he wants my money. What is the motivation for creation? Well, he wants sons. Yeah. 
But sons are an expression of who I am. So God wants to express himself. And we become the platform of his expression. Which is this merger thing. This indissoluble union. So you come and say, oh, Manly, that was great. You did, you did, a, you did a great thing. And am I going to say, yeah. When I know good and well, it wasn't just, it was, it was, it was. And was it him? Yeah. Was it me? Yeah. It was us. <laughs> That's some kind of a wild thing, isn't it? And do you, do you see how, how important that concept is? Because if Christianity is just, I kneel at an altar and God forgives me of my sins and now I got to go out and do the right thing. Well, okay. See, see wow. That's, that's awful, folks. That's just awful. If it's, if, it's, if it's just God forgiving me and writing my name down so I can go to heaven and now I'm saved and, and then, then, I can, then, I, then I struggle all my life or is it he really wants to come and merge with me and indwell me and begin to express himself through me and in the oneness with his personhood. This, and Jesus is the prototype of this. Anything else? Appreciate this. You've helped me think it through. Um, okay, in, in light of this, this statement then, uh, we've talked about this, the total nature of God and the total, total nature of man. Uh, it's not half and half. It's all of God and all of man contained in one person. In one, in one person. And Jesus was the indissoluble union. Again, you can't split it, you can't divide it, you can't find it. Uh, so it flows totally within, both flow totally within the personality of the individual. But you also have to understand uh, this first part of the statement. The second member of the Trinity. And we need to talk about the Trinity. If we're done talking about this. Anything else on this? Okay, let's go to the Trinity. Now, in the Old Testament, the Trinity, and by the way, the word Trinity is never found in the Scriptures. It's not a biblical term. It's a theological term. And some people have gotten bent out of shape about that. And said, since it isn't in the, the word, the word isn't in the scriptures. Well, in the first place, it's an English word. But regardless, uh, everywhere you go in the Old Testament, every time you read the word Elohim, which is translated God, it's plural. Hmm. Well, what about the New Testament? Not true in the New Testament. Well, why did they change it? Because it's the Greek language now. We've moved from Hebrew in the Old Testament. Elohim, which was always plural. We've moved to uh, Theos in the New Testament, which is Greek. And the Greeks had this concept. You, you know about the Greek mythology and Hercules and all of this stuff. All of these. You've seen all those programs on TV. So you know all about that. So here's all... There, the Greeks developed a whole society of gods who got married, had houses, had kids, and just pestered mankind just for the fun of it. Well, if you were writing in their language and you were going to write gods every time you said God and made it not singular but plural, in your language and culture, that would refer to that many gods see and they weren't going to do that because we have one God we don't have lots of gods we have one God so they they, they, they made it singular which we understand 
<clears throat> so, it was suggested, this Trinity idea is consistently suggested in the Old Testament. Again in the creation, God said, let us make man in our image. The Tower of Babel, let us, God said, let us go down and see what man is doing. And then again, it's plural. So everywhere you go in the Old Testament, you get this suggestion of the, and yet God constantly told the Israelites, and they constantly quoted the scripture that says, our God is one God. So they didn't believe in a lot of gods. They didn't believe in multitudes of God, and yet God was plural. See, that's bigger than what you can think. Because it seems like it contradicts itself, and I understand that. So there's more going on here. There's a mystery going on here that nobody has ever been able to explain. And yet it's, it's significantly laid out in the, New Test, in, in the scriptures. Then when you come into the New Testament, this, this pluralistic thing of the Old Testament, this Trinity idea that's suggested in the Old Testament is clarified in the New in the teachings of Jesus. As he begins to talk about baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you get this, this presentation of God the Father, God the Son, and that the Holy Spirit is going to come in Pentecost. And you get this, this, this three thing going on. Now the interesting thing about, uh, about the Trinity, well, let me save that. And again, nobody, you understand, nobody in the history of Christendom has ever explained the Trinity. Because again, there's, there's stuff here that we have, we have no idea about. But we do know something about it. While again, we don't know everything, we do know something. What do we know? We know that we believe in one God. We don't believe in three gods. That there is something going on in the relationship of these three three individual persons that have brought them in such unity that they think as one, they act as one, they are one. No, they're three. No, they're one. Now, the closest we come to that, again, here stands this handsome young man, here stands this lovely young lady, and uh, they enter into a relationship called marriage. And we say they are now one flesh. Oh, well, they're not one, they're two. But marriage in its finest is an infiltration, a yielding of, a giving of yourself to the other to the point that something of you ceases to be and it is in them. And they become an extension of you and you become an extension of them. And there's some kind of uh, mystical, and Paul goes into this in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 about, or chapter 5, about, about, he talks about marriage and the one flesh of husband and wife and says, I'm really talking about the mystery of Christ and his church. There's something going on here that's bigger than, than physical and a oneness takes place. Now, I believe I believe that the scripture teaches that the thing that unites them is what we call cross style uh, or holiness or dying to yourself or the giving of yourself up or the embracing of your helplessness. That that's what makes them one. In other words, this member of the Trinity said, I'm not going to live for myself, I'm going to live for you. And he yields himself totally to these two. And this one yields totally to these two. And this one yields totally to these two. And each member of the Trinity has crucified, been crucified, has the nature of crucifixion, has the nature of non-selfish, unselfishness. And in the yieldedness of themselves in a in the act of crucifixion, they have literally become one. And they function as one. They think as one. They are one. Now, there's been lots of uh, attempts to explain the Trinity. Like, uh, I am a Trinity. 
Uh, I function as a preacher. I function as a husband. I function as a general goof off. And I do some things better than others. So here, but that's not this. That's not this. That's not a proper explanation. We're not talking about one person with three functions. We're talking about three distinct individual personhoods. We on track there? We're not talking about one person. We're talking about three distinct persons. Uh, he has a mind. He has a mind. He has a mind. He has a will. He has a will. He, ha he has emotions. He has emotions. He has emotions. Every member of the Trinity is a solid, complete person. So we're not talking about one person acting three roles. We're talking about three distinct personalities. Uh, some have tried to explain it like uh, you... Uh, Liquid, you drink, you freeze it, it's ice, you boil it, it's steam. So you got three manifestations of one. That's not this. I'm telling you, that's not this. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with three distinct personalities. And these three di distinct personalities f are so united together that they have become one. So we don't believe in three gods. If you say we do, uh, we'll laugh you out of town. We believe in one God. Any, anything you want to say? Yes. This is not even close to being the whole story, but there's one little piece that kind of helps to demonstrate, I think, what you're saying. In the book, The Shack, any of you who have not read The Shack, please, please do so. It's the greatest book they've ever written other than scripture. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, that, it, it, it's a good book. <laughs> we can talk about it, actually. Huh? We, can, we, can, we can talk about okay. it. Okay. Anyway, uh, be that me. That's not my point. <laughs> there, there were three separate people. Yeah. And they were the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But they were shown yeah. up as humans. Yeah. In this story. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful display. Yeah. In one situation, the character in the story was talking with the father. And later, he was talking with the son. And the son knew the conversation he had with the father. And he said, I didn't tell you that. How did you know? And he said, what you tell the father, I hear. Hmm. I think that it's it's a tiny piece of the mm -hmm. thing you're talking about. Yeah. But it's a, a piece that kind of demonstrates how can you do that? And the ultimate yeah. answer is the trend. Yeah. It's an amazing I mean it isn't something that you could sit down and say, let's dream us uh, let's dream something up. It's just it, it's it's remarkable. And this Trinity anybody else by the way? This Trinity as revealed to us. And you understand this Trinity may be, who knows what, what our God is really capable of or is, is like. I mean, we know, I, I think we've hardly scratched the surface. But it's revealed to us in the scriptures. He is revealed to us in function. In other words, this member of the Trinity here is revealed to us as Father, which is a function, not a name. It bespeaks a role that he plays. And you understand that all the roles are depicted in redemption. In other words, why is he the Father? Because that's the role he he operates in, that's the role he plays in the plan of redemption. In other words, here's a Trinity God who decided, I'm going to redeem man, and immediately this member of the Trinity became the father in that redemption plan. And we look at him, and he says, I want to be the one who runs the show. I want to be the one who sits on the throne. I want to be the one who controls Mars and Jupiter. I want to control gravity. I want to keep everything operating. I'll be the overseer. Well, that's the father image 
So we look at him and say, oh, you're the father. Now what discourages me is that when in a, before a normal congregation, when I stand up and say, God, they think of this guy. And I'm not talking about this guy only. I'm talking about these two also. <laughs> so I've, I've been saying the Trinity God often when I, when I talk to congregations. The Trinity God, which bespeaks all three. Because this, yes, he is God. Totally, absolutely God. But he's only, and he's not a third God. He's not one third of God. You understand? He's total God. But there are two other personalities. And again, they play a role. This member of the Trinity plays the role of spirit. I want to be the one that crawls down inside of people and, and just pesters the living daylights out of them and, and flow and makes them feel so bad they can't hardly stand it and then, and then bring forgiveness and, and release and peace and, and oh, I want to administrate the whole, the whole movement of redemption in his life. Wow, okay, you're going to have to be a spirit to do that. Oh, you are. Since you're so holy, we'll call you Holy Spirit, which is a role he plays. It's not his name. It's, it bespeaks his function in redemption. And, and of course, this member of the Trinity said, I'm glad you left this for me. I want to be the one who goes down to earth and it literally becomes the man and pulls this all off. So we call him the son, but he's not a son. Like you're a son. See, that's Matthew's whole point and Luke as well. That he wasn't, because again, there is no mother here. See, there is no, there is no sexual production here. See, this is way beyond that. This is this member of the Trinity taking, assuming the total, the nature of God and the total nature of man in one person. This is the, this is the second member of the Trinity leaping off of his throne, assuming the body and nature of man. So all of these terms that we are so familiar with are, are seen in, now can you, uh, yes sir. So when Jesus became man, did he, I don't know how to explain this or say this, um, when he became man, did he have to think like all three of them or act like all three of them? Hmm, I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, What's that? Can you clarify? Uh, did he go from did he go from man to did, was he was he God in the sense of still thinking what it, Wayne describes the way I'm thinking what you're saying? So did he come down and automatically still know what the Trinity God was thinking, or did he assume the, the role of a, of a man? Yeah, well, we're going to get into that, but uh, let's if you don't mind, I'd like to hold that right now. But that 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 is significant, and we we need to discuss that all the way through. Uh, we, sh we sure do. Um, <clears throat> and and maybe, maybe, it, it, maybe it is time to move into that, but uh, I, wa I want to give you this one more thought. Uh, think about this, okay? If this is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this depicts roles that they are playing in their redemption plan. So the whole Bible, do you understand that the whole Bible is focused just on this redemptive plan. What else are these guys doing? We don't know. Do you, do you think they have other stuff going on? And they play roles in other places? See, you, you can't take this God of ours and limit him to this role. He's bigger than the role of father, the role of son. Who knows what, what else is going on in there? Are you saying there could be like other worlds in the universe? I don't know. Why not? Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we be selfish and self-centered to think we're the only ones that, that, he, that he didn't go someplace else and try this, uh, try this creating man and it worked? Who knows? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all to me at this point. So I'm just saying this. Don't, don't think that this is, you can limit him to this. He's bigger than all that. That's, that's the point. Whatever that means. 
We have no idea. Okay, let's see. Uh, was there anything else in the Trinity idea? But this, this is really, this, is, this, this concept of Trinity is absolutely significant, absolutely has to be. See, if you deny this, then I, I don't know where you go. And there are parts of Christianity that do deny this. There are people who don't believe that there is a trinity. And, I, and again, this, is a pivot, this whole concept of incarnation is a pivotal idea. So, let's go back to your idea, Corey. Your, your question and idea. Okay, so this member of the trinity leaps off of his throne... And becomes man. And of course the obvious immediate question is what, what was that like? Now one thing you've got to constantly guard against is ever in your mind. Don't ever in your mind or ever in your talk indicate that Jesus at any time is not God. You just don't want to do that. In other words, don't say, well, yeah, he was God here, but now, oh, he's no longer God. Yes, he is. Because we're talking about the nature of God and the nature of man in an indissoluble union. So he's always God. When he walks on the water, he's God. When he dies on a cross, he's God. When he's raised from the dead, he's God. There's never a time. Jesus never gave up being God. Never. And that is so significant. Because if Jesus isn't God, then you know that this thing doesn't mean anything. Because lots of nice guys died, people. But it didn't mean anything to me. The reason this means something is because Jesus is God. And this is the death of God. This is God giving his eternal life. Laying it on the line. Uh, so in your thought process and in, as you approach this, don't ever, and, and we do that a lot. I, I get that a lot. Somebody will say, uh, uh, well, God did, well, I mean Jesus. Like Jesus isn't God. See, don't do that. Because Jesus is always God. And you have a right to refer to him as God. Okay, having said that. Now, he's become man. Now, just logically, none of you believe for one single minute that when Jesus popped out of his mother's womb, he knew the whole vocabulary of his language. None of you believe that. In fact, you can't go any place that anybody believes that. Because that's ridiculous. Right? Well, you want to believe it. You want to believe it? I do. <laughs> you're talking about the Trinity God. You're talking about the most powerful, om omniscient, uh, omnipresent. We're talking about the Trinity God. I want to believe he popped out and knew everything because... My mind has a disconnect, and it's, I'm sure that it's my immaturity and all this. My mind has a disconnect between Jesus coming down as a sovereign God. Mike, the microphone is behind you. Oh, oh yeah. thank you. Yeah. People, Jesus, want to hear, people want to hear what you have to say. My mind has a disconnect, and it might be the immaturity, but Jesus comes down as a sovereign Trinity God, one of the Trinity. And he comes down without separation of them three, of course my mom wants to believe that he came out hopping and skipping straight out of the womb. Now, I know, I know that the Bible don't speak that way, but uh, my mind... My uh, okay, does the Bible speak the opposite of that? No. Oh, it doesn't? Well, hold on, tell it again. Does the Bible speak the opposite of that? In other words, does the Bible tell you that God did, that Jesus didn't come? That Jesus was born, God, as, God is born, and he comes out of his mother's womb, and he doesn't know anything. Does the Bible say that? 
I can't, I, I can't really say yes or no because I'm not mature enough to. Well, turn to Luke. In verse 52. Yes, sir. Um, what about Hebrews 5 eight? Yes, though he was a son, yet learned he obedience. So Jesus learned. What did you tell him to go? Luke chapter 2. <laughs> verse 52. I don't want you to go anyplace, sir. <laughs> Stay close. <laughs> Luke 1:52? No. Chapter 2, verse 52. Hmm. How do you increase in wisdom when you know everything? See, nobody believes that Jesus popped out of his mother's womb knowing everything. And then there's the whole temple thing. And yeah. That he's in the temple and he's asking questions in the temple. Still, you left my, not yours, no, not yours. My imagination wants to take, my imagination wants to take me out of the field because of the not knowing the knowledge of all of it. So, that's just me personally speaking. Do I believe that? He had to learn everything, yes, but my imagination was taken the opposite way. Yeah. I got a big imagination. Though. Yeah, I understand. But you see, what you believe, this is what I'm trying to tell you, and, and I really want you to get this. This is how important this is. If you believe that Jesus popped out of his mother's womb and he knew everything and he had an edge on us, because he, he, he was operating in the flesh with sovereign power and, 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 and omnipotence and omniscience. And, and, and he never got sick and he didn't need to wash his feet. And, and he just, it, that's the way he operated. So he was really God just dressed up in a Halloween suit. <laughs> See, if you believe that, he was a fake, he was a fake man. Then you come to me and say, well, manly, you've got to be Christ-like. And I'm going to look at you and say, well... <laughs> hey, I'm, well, Joel, Joel's favorite statement to me all these years has been, I don't walk on water. What's he meaning by that? Well, I'm not Jesus. And Jesus was God and I don't walk on water. Like Jesus had something I can't have. See, that's, that's what he's saying by that. Uh, so if you believe that Jesus had something you can't have, then Christ-likeness and well, yeah, I'm, I, it's ideal and, and the life of Jesus is, is an example and we ought to try to be like that, but nobody ever is. And see, it's, it's, but if you believe that Jesus became man and didn't have any of that power at all, but as a total man with everything that's going on in you was going on in him and that he was filled with the Spirit and the reason he did what he did isn't that he's God, but he was a man filled with God then you can be that way too and it eliminates all your excuses. Yes, sir. Where I sometimes struggle with that and I'm, I'm, part of me tends to believe that, that yes, Jesus did have a leg up because he did not have an earthly father, if you will, his fatherly DNA was God. But then also I, I remind myself that when he was born, he was not filled with the Spirit. That that came later. So I do sometimes struggle with that. Well, we do believe in that distinction. You're, you're exactly right. In other words, we believe that the virgin birth is so significant because Jesus was born without the carnal nature. We believe that. But the reason that doesn't give him a leg up on you is the fact that when he enters into you and cleanses you, we believe that that carnal nature comes to death as it was in him. I believe that Jesus had lived in a world that was under the curse of sin. He got tired. Well, did Adam and Eve ever get tired? I believe that Jesus... Uh, I believe that Jesus lived in a world he dealt with mosquitoes. 
And there were cockroaches. He lived in a world that wasn't right. That had the curse of sin upon it. So everything you're facing in your world, he was facing. Tempted at every point like we've been tempted. So, see, you've got to deal with that sometime. Um, so, again, back to how important this is. If you believe that Jesus had an edge up on... Well, let me give you an example. Okay, we're starting this business. Let's say, uh, let's start a septic business. What do you think? Yeah, you like it? Okay. Uh, what, how are we going to do this? Well, we got to have... Uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, get some kind of a, a used uh, backhoe that somebody has thrown away. Okay, we got one now. And uh, we'll uh, uh, print up some flyers and we'll go around and we'll try to build up some business. And in the meantime, we got to have a full-time job uh, to, uh, to survive until the business builds up. And, uh, and we're always, the, the backhoe's always breaking down. And we got, and he didn't, and, and, and it just, and wow. And, and finally, after a couple years of struggling, it folds. Well, this other guy, he starts a septic business. But his dad's a billionaire and gives him a million dollars. So he gets the best of equipment. Right out of the chute. Gets a full-time advertiser. And man, within a year, he's in, the, he's in the black. Well, see, my business failed. His didn't. Well, why? <laughs> he had an edge on me. See, Jesus has got an edge on me. See, he's a, he's a cut above. He's, he's beyond me. He's, he's got something I can't have. He's got a... And what if he didn't? See, that's the point. And what you believe about that is so important because if you believe Jesus had an edge on you, then being Christ-like and holiness and having victory over sin is always idealistic. Yeah, well... You know, maybe when we get to heaven, we're all struggling. We're all trying. Yeah, nobody's perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, you, you go that direction. But if you believe that Jesus was totally, absolutely man and had no edge on you and started his business out of the garage and had a broken down mini X to, to start with, if you believe that and yet he was successful, you've got to say, Wow. If I can have what he had, I can have victory too. And those are, and those are the difference in the theological arguments of, of all ages. What you believe about this guy right here and what happened when he became this. That's how and it is a pivotal issue. Oh, yes, sir. He was all powerful which means that he had the power to do what you and I can't do and that is eliminate himself from himself all of his attributes we can't do that but he could as God but when he did that that's exactly what he did gave up all of his attributes he's so powerful that he can do that and did it Okay, uh, anything else? What I want to do is, and I don't want to start it now, but what I want to do is I want to go into uh, several scriptures, walk you through some of the scriptures uh, that just yell at me about this. And I, and I want you to help me with this. I really do. Because I for the life of me, cannot see why any Bible scholar couldn't see this. I mean, it's so obvious, so plain. And yet, I read all kinds of material where it, we just go right over the top of it like it isn't even there. And I, I can't understand it. So I want to go over lots of scriptures with you. And we'll do that next week. So we'll get into the biblical content of this concept. Well, let's pray. Lord, whew. 
Everything that went on in you, I want it to go on in me. If I would surrender to you like you surrender to the Father, could I live like you lived? So, um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go after you. I, I'm, I'm going to focus on you. You and me in intimacy and oneness. I want to drag you into the middle of everything going on in my life. I want to refer everything to you. I don't want anything happening in my living that you aren't in the middle of. I thank you for the possibility of this. I thank you for the revelation of your word that teaches it. And we, we give ourselves to you tonight for this purpose. So bless us through the rest of this week and into the weekend. And our services on Sunday and the movement of God among us. We give ourselves to you for what you want to do in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you.